This is Steve Zeltzer with KPFA Workweek Radio, and I'm joined this morning with Daryl Whitman. He was a federal investigator and lawyer with the Whistleblower Protection Program in OSHA, and he has been fighting against his being uh, terminated, bullied by OSHA, and has been fighting for the government to uh, investigate his case and for uh, prosecution of those people who are involved in what he charges are criminal uh, retaliation and conspiracy to, against him. So welcome to Workweek Radio, Daryl. So Daryl, why don't you talk about the importance of your case and where it's at now because you have gotten this letter and what you've been fighting for for many years is a letter from the OSC Office of Special Counsel that you in fact had been illegally discharged. What I've been fighting for, and I think this goes back to 2012 when I first started to raise the issues inside of OSHA, is I've been fighting for a legitimate, comprehensive investigation of uh, what appears to be you know, widespread criminal behavior. In uh, uh, when I began, I thought it was in OSHA. Then, as I went along and I began to see deeper into the problem and the relationships, it became obvious that the corruption extended to many other parts of the Department of Labor. And then, of course, in 2014 it became apparent that the Secretary of Labor, Thomas Perez, was a major source of corruption in the Department of Labor. So at that point, after I was terminated, uh, as a federal employee, you're supposed to take your case to what's called the U.S. Office of Special Counsel. And like the Whistleblower Protection Agency inside of OSHA, the OSC is the Whistleblower Protection Agency for Federal Workers. So as I got involved in the OSC, you know, I began to see a situation that looked very similar to what I saw with OSHA and its whistleblower program. There was an apparent systemic corruption in the OSC that was basically turning away complaints and and preventing investigations of corruption in the federal government everywhere. So again, this is the agency that's responsible for taking these you know, reports of corruption and then referring them, reviewing them and referring them back to agencies to be investigated and then you know, to take whatever corrective action needs to be taken to get rid of the corruption. And, and what I realized was they, they weren't doing that at all. They were doing quite the opposite. They were attacking whistleblowers, not just me, but many other uh, federal employees that had gone to them you know, believing that they were going to be protected by this agency, it wasn't true. In fact, you know, there's a pattern here, uh, <laughs> loosely referred to as contain, isolate, and destroy. That's kind of a tactical approach to dealing with whistleblowers that present cases that are politically problematic. You know, cases that might involve big companies, you know, been fraud with the government, or high-level public officials that are using the office for their own purposes rather than serving the public. And, and the contain is basically, you know, to get people going to an agency like the Office of Special Counsel. Just like in the private sector, they try to get people to go to the Whistleblower Protection Program. That contains them. And then <laughs> you isolate them because these programs are designed to drag out investigations, punish whistleblowers, and basically make you regret ever having, to, ever having opened your mouth. And in the end, if you don't you know, give up, you don't cave in to the pressure, they will try to destroy you. And the, so, the capturing of agencies like OSHA, like uh, you know, right. FAA, uh, where, right. you know, with uh, FedEx, uh, of, of many, many agencies, national uh, the yes. uh, regulatory commission, uh, nuclear energy. I mean, it seems like this is an epidemic of yes, uh, yes. of agencies that have been captured by the very companies that are supposed to regulate. Is that true? Yeah. Oh yes, that's true. And it's the reason they're doing that, the reason they're able to get away with doing that, is because if you work for one of these agencies and you see this corruption, where you're supposed to go is to the office of special counsel to report it. And you will end up just like the whistleblowers in the program I was working with. They will be, you know, you will be contained, isolated, and ultimately destroyed. And you're also talking about the biggest banks, Wells Fargo, uh, J.P. Morgan, which have been 
violating the law, committing criminal acts, and nothing happens to them, really. Absolutely, because they're protected. This is a giant protection racket. And how have you been able to break through, and how did you get this document saying that they believe that you'd been improperly removed because of corruption inside the federal government? Well, uh, there's, there's strategic and there's tactical approaches to issues. It, it, strategically, you need to have support of people. And I've been very fortunate to have the support of, of, of some journalists like yourself and, and, and Anne March and, and Liz Wagner, but also a large group of whistleblowers have come forward. We've formed an alliance. We talk to each other. We share information and we act, you know, we, we engage in coordinated activities to try to protect and support each other. So as I, my odyssey through the OSC uh, continued, you know, I began to see that uh, what was going on here was not just corruption inside of the OSC. What it involved was the Government Accountability Project, which I had signed on to in the beginning. Uh, I, I discovered about a year, and almost not quite a year and a half ago, that the OSC was in fact collaborating with the Office of Special Counsel to contain, isolate, and destroy whistleblowers. And this is a very elaborated relationship. This is organized crime. Uh, to put, it, put a finer point on it, it's as much organized crime as the mafia in Sicily. And the relationships are personal and widespread, uh, going inside the government, outside the government, you know, to, to these groups like like GAP, but they go even further than that into other groups and, and, and individuals that that are part of a network of people who are involved in using government for their own purposes. So uh, once I discovered that and then I documented it and I got to a point here about a month ago and I said, okay, this is enough, and I fired GAP and I immediately... And why did you gap? What is gap? And why did you fire it? Gap is the government accountability project. And I fired them because they were corrupt and they were complicit in basically blocking my case, dragging it out for almost three and a half years now, uh, inflicting a lot of damage, personal damage on me and my health and my financial situation. But also they were, as I learned, because it's a process of learning, you know, they uh, they represent themselves as the you know, whistleblower group in the country, and they like to go around and advertise that, and that somehow they're expert. They only work with the Office of Special Counsel, and it turned out that the Office of Special Counsel and GAP had a lot of close personal relationships. Let me put it that way. Um, and uh, it was very clear once I began to identify specific events and link it together, draw that picture, uh, what had been going on from the beginning was an effort to destroy me and my complaint. And so w once I fired them, I, I resorted back to what I know best, which is the law. And I looked at the Whistleblower Protection Act, the Federal Whistleblower Protection Act. And uh, I relied on the on the law and the fact that Henry Kerner, the new OSC director, what well, looked like a pretty straight shooter. So I appealed to his being a 20-year uh, federal prosecutor and said, Henry, this is the law and this is what's going on. And I, I, wanna, I want a, this letter, this what's called a substantial likelihood, likelihood uh, letter that's saying, you know, there's a substantial likelihood that what you're reporting is true. It needs to be investigated. So I, I asked for that and I got it within 24 hours. So it told me that by going outside of GAP, outside of the channels, going directly to the director, the, the well, it's called, actually called the special counsel himself, and telling him what was going on and, 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 and basically saying, this is a law, Henry, I want you to follow the law. It's been in violation for three over three and a half years. Time, time to do it right. And he did. And that was it. And the letter then requires that there be an investigation of the corruption, what is happening with that? Because if, well, if, as you say, it's endemic, it's in many agencies, and there are many whistleblowers, the Department of Defense and others, it seems yep. like the whole government has to investigate itself. How is this going to happen? Well, how it's going to happen is, uh, we're, we're test, I'm testing the waters right now as we speak. They, they issue what's called a referral, which is the, the order to the, the 
Secretary of Labor to conduct an investigation. But the law requires that that investigation be done on the basis of the uh, allegations that were that I made way back in January of 2015. And Mr. Kerner, I think, was not watching the ball, as it were. He sent it back down to one of his low-level subordinates, who is part of this corrupt network inside of OSC. And what she did was she wrote a referral that was complete crap. <laughs> it had nothing of the allegations I made uh, in my um, disclosures back in 2015. As soon as I saw that, I composed a letter to Henry and said, Henry, pay attention because this referral is crap. <laughs> it does not follow the law. And uh, I want you to confirm for me that the allegations I raised in my letter back way back in January 2015 are indeed going to be the basis for an investigation. Because if they're not, it's going to be a false investigation. It's going to be simply another uh, cover up. So we're now at that point and trying to decide, you know, he's trying to decide what he's going to do because the law is on my side and he knows that. Uh, but on the other side, he's got a, an agency, 137 people in this agency. And at the top of the agency is this group that's connected to all these other groups outside uh, in, in the government and outside the government that are fundamentally corrupt, that are part of a criminal conspiracy. So, you know, think about it. If you are if you're <laughs> if you get assigned to running a department in Sicily <laughs> and all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, here I am in the middle of Sicily and what is Sicily famous for? It's famous for the Sicilian mafia. Uh, what am I going to do? Well, in Sicily over the last 10, 15 years, a lot of judges have been killed for trying to, to uh, uh, break up the, 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 the mafia and to prosecute mobsters. Uh, that's Sicily, that's, that's Italy, and, and it's famous for that. We haven't gotten quite to that point yet, but uh, for an agency head, someone who's been there eight months and doesn't really know, you know his way around, doesn't have allies inside the, uh, the organization, it's a very tricky proposition. So uh, what's going to happen soon is I, I'm going to take my, my case public again, and uh, I'm filing a, uh, a form which is going to ask for an investigation of the Office of Special Counsel. And, uh, and th this, is, I mean, this agency itself obviously has compromised itself, has uh, colluded uh, with the government officials who've been doing illegal activities in retaliation against whistleblowers. But also there's a connection between this agency and Democratic Party leaders uh, like Nancy Pelosi, like Senator Feinstein, who you provided information yeah. about your case. Oh, yeah. I mean, you went to all many of these. Who did you go to, uh, the politicians, your representatives, to rectify what had happened and to investigate what had happened? Yeah, I, I first went to my congressperson, uh, Barbara Lee, in Oakland, uh, because uh, it started, all started out with the fact that within the Department of Labor in San Francisco, there's been a wholesale attack on p people uh, with disabilities, on um, minorities, and on women. There's no respect for the EEO and laws to protect people. So when I saw that, and as a union steward, I saw a lot of it. You know, I went to Congresswoman Lee's office in Oakland and I said, look, you know, this is what's going on. You know, this is a real serious problem. And to my shock, I learned that, oh, yes, they known, knew, had known about it for several years, but had done nothing. And why did and, they do nothing? Well, that's a good question. I think that's something that Miss Lee needs to be asked. How was it you knew about this for years and somehow never managed to be effective in doing anything about it? Uh, I suspect that the same was true with Nancy Pelosi because most of the federal workers live in her district or in, in the, the other congresswoman, Jackie Spears' district. Th that's where you go. If you have a problem uh, with a federal agency, your first stop usually is to go to your congressperson and ask for assistance. So when I talked to Barbara Lee's office and found out it was widespread and it was known, 
that this was going on for years, I, I, you know, I had to ask the question, well, what's going on here that we're not giving any kind of representation on this issue? And, of course, it was partly, and this is, I'm making this uh, deduction, the Department of Labor during this period was under the control of the Obama administration. It was originally, you know, Hilda Solis was the secretary, and then Tom Perez came in. Hilda Solis was corrupt. Uh, and that's why she was forced to resign her office. And Tom Perez, turns out, is even more corrupt. So there's a, a reluctance on the part of Democratic Congress people, and I suspect it goes beyond that, to confront these issues of corruption because in th- their party loyalty is stronger than their loyalty to the public interest. I can't. I don't think I can put it any more clearly than that. And this takes place in the midst of a war going on, uh, internecine warfare in the Republican Party, internecine warfare in the Democratic Party, and warfare between the Democrats and Republicans. What is the likelihood that these cases and this obstruction of justice and corruption uh, in the federal government, in these agencies, is going to come out in congressional hearings uh, and uh, in a criminal investigation in the midst of uh, the upcoming election? Well, we'll find out, because that's exactly what I'm asking for today, uh, that I'll, I'll be asking that uh, of President Trump. That I'm going to send a, a special form uh, to report uh, what's going on inside the office of special counsel, and I'm asking for a criminal investigation outside, credible, uh, because of the corruption that I've been able to identify, and I've identified specific issues, specific people, and that's known now, so it's not just a broadside. I can I can walk it back to very specific things, and they're all violations of law, uh, and they all demonstrate the corruption of the uh, Office of Special Counsel. So I'm, I'm going to ask for that, uh, an outside uh, criminal investigation. Uh, notice to President Trump that, that I've asked for that, uh, and it will go to all of the uh, Congress people, senators, uh, and I know that at least some of them, particularly uh, Senator Grassley and and Senator Johnson uh, in, in the uh, House, I mean in the in the Senate uh, uh, whistleblower caucus, have been very concerned, very interested, and uh, been trying themselves to get into this system and figure out what in the world is going wrong with the Office of Special Counsel. The importance can't be overstated because this is. The place where, if you're going to have a legitimate government that's operated, you know, within the bounds of public interest, the Office of Special Counsel is specifically tasked with doing that, with ensuring, you know, the federal employees can come and say, hey, you know, this is bad things going on in my agency. Here, take a look at it and and investigate and and, uh, do something about it. If that doesn't work, then you don't have a federal government conspiracy. And the situation in the Bay Area, you have a the biggest eco-fraud in the United States. A billion dollars of U.S. tax money was spent in the cleanup at, uh, supposed cleanup at Hunters Point Naval Shipyard, which was radioactively uh, contaminated over many decades, and Treasure Island, which is contaminated. The politicians here in the Bay Area, Kamala Harris, Dianne Feinstein, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Gavin Newsom, uh, who is likely to be the next governor. How are they involved in what has been going on at Hunter's Point with uh, Test America and Michael Madry? Well, at least some of them, and I know specifically uh, Senator Feinstein's office has is, is been informed of this. I had conversations with uh, Carson Niello, her, her uh, chief of staff there in San Francisco, gave him documents told them explicitly what was going on with the corruption of testing processes, including, you know, the, what was going on in with Test America and their relationship to Hunter's Point and Treasure Island. And when I actually submitted documentation showing it, they, I got a, 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 an email back saying, thanks, but no thanks, we're not interested in looking at it. So, you know, it, you, as a public official, you, you, you have a choice of representing the public or special interests your own interests, and I suspect, I mean, in, in my experience with uh, Senator Feinstein, it came down to uh, it was politically inconvenient to address the problem of corruption in the testing process and that might affect 
her con- her interests in uh, San Francisco and around the state. So, and the same thing with Congresswoman Spear. Uh, I, I had conversations. I, I uh, one one of the people I worked with had a personal conversation with her staff. Went all the way down there. Uh, I think I think you attended that. That's correct. And uh, gave great detail about what was going on, corruption in the financial industry. And, and then I followed up by giving her a uh, considerable amount of more information, specific information about that. And, of course, the corruption in the testing industry and air, airline industry and nuclear plants, etc. cetera. And uh, then uh, uh, a colleague of mine went to her office and took and met with her and took the documents with her and handed them to her. I never heard back from her. So, so Congresswoman, Congresswoman, my, my, Congresswoman Jackie Spear was provided with all this information. She likes yes. to call herself a, uh, a defender of whistleblowers. So she was right. provided I, all this that. information, she, and yeah. and apparently it just disappeared. Well, it certainly disappeared out of her consciousness, didn't it? <laughs> Um, you know, there are people in, in public life who, who like they like to, you know, be, be look like the good guys. Let's put on the white hat and say, you know, I'm, I'm for, you know, whatever it is, women's rights or the environment or whistleblowers. And but they, when, when you start looking at what they actually do and you have to do that, if you're going to support them politically, you need to hold their feet to the fire on what they do, not what they say. Uh, and when you look at what they do, too often you find people that it's all hollow, it's all smoke, there's no substance to it, that it somehow conflicts with their other agendas, perhaps fundraising, perhaps they have a political agenda or a personal agenda uh, that doesn't fit in with the public interest. Well, the defense of the Obama administration, how is the Obama administration tied into this systemic corruption in OSHA and the Office of Special Counsel? It's directly tied into it. I mean, uh, in uh, 2014, when I and the actual director of the program I was working with both raised the issue of potential corruption in the program that was crippling, and it was obvious it was crippling the program, and we both asked for an outside audit, we both got fired. (laughs) And guess who did the firing? It was done under the supervision of Tom Perez, you know the, and we know who Tom Perez is now, don't we? Um, He's the chair uh, chair of the Democratic Party of the United correct, States. Yes. Correct. Uh, and obviously, he's a close friend of Hillary Clinton's. He's you know in with with uh, the Podesta group in the Democratic Party. Uh, you know the old line people who want to control it. But it was interesting because they, they actually you could see the shadow in the background of the White House manipulating the situation in. Uh, in OSHA and in the Department of Labor uh, to to bottle up any potential uh, scandal. And they didn't care what it took. You know, they would fire people right and left. They fired everybody, practically everybody in my group because it was it threatened to uh, explode into a major scandal and that was not politically acceptable. What was politically acceptable was the corruption of the whistleblower protection program. And we're talking about lawyers in the Region 9 of OSHA, the Whistleblower Protection Program in San Francisco, who were all bullied, harassed, and, and removed from their positions uh, in that office in, in the federal building in San Francisco. Correct. And it didn't really even stop there because it, it you know extended to other uh, areas of the country. Uh, I know a couple of several people in Region 10 up in, in Seattle quit or were forced out of their job. We're talking about, Daryl, the basically targeting of Whistleblower Protection Program Unit in, at OSHA in Region 9 right. in San Francisco. What happened at that unit that you were working with, along with other lawyers in this uh, program? Well, th- they basically realized, you know, we, lawyers have a divided loyalty, you know. We're, we all take an oath uh, to def- uh, pull to defend the Constitution, which means we're officers of the court. And if we see wrongdoing, violations of law, we are bound, you know, with a, with a risk of losing our license to report that. That's our obligation. Now, a lot of lawyers don't, you know, pay attention to it, but a lot of lawyers do. The good ones do. So all, all of my colleagues, uh, all but one at that time, were, were lawyers, and we all saw the same thing. And we were trying to get corrected, uh, corrective action for it. 
and uh, they uh, attacked, personally attacked a couple of people, you know, and in very threatening ways and, and uh, trashed them personally and professionally and drove them out. So at the end, within a year uh, of my removal, all of the lawyers, the attorney investigators were gone. This was also the same tactic that was applied in other areas of OSHA around the country, was to get rid of lawyers because lawyers, if they're good, if they're honest, they re, you know they hold your feet to the fire for observing the law. And if you have corrupt senior officials that don't want to be held accountable, they don't want lawyers around looking at what they're doing. So this must have been very personally destructive for these workers, these lawyers at the agency. Oh, amazing. Yes, of course. You know, I, I won't go into detail about my, my experience, but my God, it, it's destroyed my life in many respects. It was an attack on my professional license. You know, I was accused of basically of being a liar and, you know, of perjuring myself, which, of course, cost me my, my law license. Uh, so I couldn't practice law. All of it, of course, was phony. But, you know, and, and that's going to get reversed soon. But it, there's tremendous personal cost to whistleblowers. And I know one of my colleagues it had tremendous impact on her health, you know, which was not great to begin with, but the, the harassment and the pressure and the personal attacks and ultimately being herself removed have a devastating effect on your ability to manage your health care. So this was um, a vendetta. It seems like a, a systemic well, vendetta against oh, yeah. lawyers who really wanted to do their job and protect the public and these whistleblowers who retaliated against for exposing health and safety problems. Well, and of course, you know, being at the irony, of course, being a whistleblower investigator, you know, I could see the same thing going on with the whistleblowers I was working with. You know, Mr. Madry and and Aaron Stuckey and and uh, the others, uh, how their lives were being destroyed. They were being attacked uh, simply for doing their job in most cases, uh, trying to speak up and and say, hey, you know, this isn't right. Uh, let's let's not do it this way. It's dangerous. It's a fraud. Whatever it is, and that's that is ninety percent of people who blow the whistle do it because it's their job. You know, they they, they don't want to work in a dangerous uh, workplace. They don't want to put the public at risk. They don't want to see people defrauded, and they try to you know do something and they get fired. And then the companies try to destroy them afterwards with the help of the federal government. <laughs> Who they go to so, to expect some protection under the law. Well, under the law, they were supposed to come to my agency, file a complaint with the uh, Office of Whistleblower Protection. And which you just simply expose them to more, <laughs> more uh, retaliation. Now, you also went to your uh, union uh, locally and nationally. What, what was your experience yeah. with American Federation of Government Employee? And you were a delegate, you were shop steward, you mentioned earlier, and also yeah. a delegate to the San Francisco Labor Council. So what happened in trying to get your union to support you and your fellow workers who were being uh, basically terrorized, bullied in the workplace, and terminated? Well, there's a very noticeable difference between local union uh, officials and, and stewards in the national office. And I can't say enough for the local officials and stewards. They gave their time, they gave their emotional support, they gave, you know, every, they did everything they possibly could because they understood the importance of trying to protect workers' rights. That's why they are union stewards. That's why, you know, I, I became part of the Central Labor Council is, you know, the, the only real power workers have is when they work together to protect each other and to advance the interests of the public. Uh, so I have I have only wonderful things to say about the local folks. The national folks are their part of the corrupt system. I mean, it was shocking in, in some ways to find out, uh, but uh, you know, I reported a lot of this to uh, uh, Brother Cox, the AFGE president, and never got a word back from him. <laughs> But uh, he knew about it, certainly knew about it. It was reported in Washington, D.C. Um, well, you were, on the, you, were on the, you were on the Daily Show talking, right? to, and they did a, a comedy piece about the fact that you, a, uh, who were supposed to investigate uh, whistleblowers, yourself was attacked. 
for blowing right. the whistle on the failure of the agency to actually enforce the law. Well, you know, the, the problems in the federal government are known to AF, AFGE national uh, leadership. That's clear to me. Uh, but there's a problem with the way the AFGE is, is organized. The national leaders all are federal employees, high-level federal employees that get release time to do their union duties. Sounds good? Well, let's look at it honestly. <laughs> it's, a, it's a payoff. They get to keep their jobs, they get to keep their privileges, they get to, you know, have lunch with Secretary Blank or, you know, Congressperson or Senator so-and-so, and so so they play ball. And the the, uh, absurdity was, you know, here, while all these horrible things were going on with the Department of Labor that I knew about, AFGE was being given a special award for cooperation with the federal government. (laughs) And I can only imagine it was for cooperating in, 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 in uh, suppressing uh, workers from, from actually accessing uh, and, and fighting for their rights. Otherwise, I'm sure these uh, agency executives would not have given them a special award unless they were doing special work for the agency. I don't think so. Considering most of the people, and not all of them, there's a few straight shooters out there, but the, what I've seen, the majority of high-level officials in government agencies are at one level or another corrupt they can be very directly and openly corrupt you know and it's sad to see go on but it does go on in many agencies or they can be institutionally corrupt which is you know i see no evil hear no evil speak no evil so when problems come up you bury them and you bury the people who who, who report them now some have said uh, uh, health and safety advocates that by attacking uh, Tom Perez, uh, who was head of the Department of Labor, attacking uh, these Democratic politicians that you're going to be hurting the labor movement. You don't buy that argument? The, the, the labor movement, uh, if you're talking about the labor movement made up of workers, employees, people who work for a living, the, the classic workers that I think of, uh, it can only help because corruption hurts everybody and it particularly hurts workers. You know, when you cannot secure a safe workplace, when your family and your, your neighbors are exposed to risks, and particularly health risks like you're seeing there in uh, San Francisco and in uh, Bayview, Hunters Point, and, and over on the uh, on Treasure Island, you're the ones that are paying the price for the corruption. I don't care what label you put on it, you know, whether they're ours or, you know, Republicans or Democrats or Independents or whatever they call themselves. That's not the issue. The issue is, are they respectful of the public interest and are they working for the public interest? That's the only issue that really counts. What would you say to the, the many whistleblowers that you have been working with? There are probably hundreds, maybe thousands of OSHA whistleblowers. Uh, some of them uh, are going to be speaking uh, tomorrow night about their struggle uh, to defend uh, their rights and the rights of the public at J.P. Morgan, at Wells Fargo, at National Park Service, uh, many other agencies. What do you say to them, these whistleblowers, about the struggle that they're involved in and uh, in the future? Because they've been under extreme pressure and attack. Some of them have been unemployed. They've lost their homes. They've lost their families. I mean, it's a dire situation for many of the whistleblowers. Yes. Well, I I can say I'm very proud to know these people. Some of the best people I've met in my life have been whistleblowers uh, over the last uh, eight years that I've worked with, uh, been associated with. They're honest people. They're people who care about their fellow workers, about their communities, about the life of the nation. Uh, they, they, They take risks sometimes, often without even realizing the risks that they're taking, but they stand up and they do the right thing. If we don't have that ethic... If we don't have that value in American life, we might as well hang it up because it's all done. You're, you're, you're going to have not a hunter's point and a, and a you know, problem out at uh, Treasure Island. You know, you're, you're going to have a, a level of risk to health and safety and financial security that you're going to be miserable. You're not going to be able to breathe a minute without worrying about the risks. And that's not the kind of a, a society I think anybody wants to live in. 
So uh, I, I hope that people are beginning to see that whistleblowers are not just you know, self-serving people. Most of them, again, are reacting because it's their job or because you know, they see something wrong and they think that you know, it needs to be corrected. Uh, and they're willing to go through the, the process of, of making the, the report. Uh, without them, uh, you know, I wouldn't get on an airplane, I wouldn't drive on the highway, I wouldn't drink the water, I wouldn't eat the food. Because you can't guarantee that I- any of it is going to uh, you know, not come back to bite you. Now, the other aspect of this is the Trump administration. Uh, they put in Scott Pruitt in the EPA. They're putting in people who uh, themselves have uh, represented the very industries which are supposed to regulate. Where is that going to uh, fit into this whole corruption scandal and cover-up scandal? Well, ultimately, again, I don't care you know, if they're a billionaire or they're a street sweeper. It doesn't make any difference. What makes the difference is, are they going to represent the public interest? Now, there's an assumption that people who are billionaires won't. But, you know, I don't think that, that it's being a billionaire or not being a billionaire. It depends on how you act. It's personal values. And, you know, some people have, you know, made a lot of money uh, doing something that they like or, or, or not. Uh, and we need to hold their feet to the fire to be sure that if they're going to take an agency or a position in government, that it's transparent, that they're accountable for the choices that they make, and, and that the public interest is the first and most important thing that they consider with every choice they make. So, you know, I don't know, you know, th- th- there's been, <laughs> let's face it, you know, in, in, the, in the Obama administration, in the, the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, you know, all the way back, there's been scandal after scandal after scandal about public officials who have, you know, abused and misused their office for personal reasons or political reasons. Uh, we need to do something about that. You know, we need we need to put an end to that. And the best way to do that is by having a, a vigorous enforcement of the laws that are on the books, because we have good laws. Believe it or not, we've got good laws. We just don't have people enforcing them. So the, the you know, unless you want to just cash it all in and say, OK, let's you know clean it out and start all over again. And think about that for a minute. You know, that, that's what you have to. That's that's the first response we should have is is looking at what we've got and seeing how we can make it better. If nothing else, we will learn about why it's not working. And in California, which is the biggest state in the country, Cal OSHA, the OSHA program, is under Governor Brown, the Department of Labor, Christine Baker, who uh, had to leave because of corruption. Uh, What is the responsibility of Cal OSHA to deal with these health and safety problems in California? Apparently, they're MIA at Treasure Island and in the biotech industry. People should understand Cal OSHA is an extension of the federal OSHA. It operates with federal money. And it was it was a deal struck uh, back when they created OSHA back in 1972 that states that wanted to continue to have their own state plan program could do so and would receive federal funding if they met the standards that were established by OSHA for their work. Well, of course, <laughs> you know, we're saying that and actually getting it done are two different things. But the federal government has the power, legal power, to uh, to ensure that the that Cal OSHA operates a, 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 at a minimum standard to protect the public interest. But if, if the federal OSHA is not doing that, you're not going to get them to stand up and do it for, for Cal OSHA either. But they can. They potentially can. People should understand this is not <clears throat> simply corruption in a state program. This is corruption that extends from the state program to the federal government itself. So you're not surprised that Cal OSHA has been MIA and missing in action in uh, investigating the systemic uh, retaliations, the falsifications of testing at Hunters Point, Bayview, and Treasure Island, uh, and the retaliation against whistleblowers? No, I I, I audited a couple of state uh, plan programs uh, when I was working with OSHA, and and what's clear is there are some states that do almost a minimum amount to to have a legitimate program, and then you have states like Nevada and California and Hawaii that just basically thumb their nose at the law and take the money and run. 
So I'm not surprised at all. The federal federal ultra does not like to bring pressure, you know, where there are political interests. You know, think about it. California, what are the political interests in California that might coincide with the federal? Or Harry Reid over there in, uh, in Nevada and the complete corruption of the Nevada OSHA program, um, you know, and under the nose and, and, and with the full knowledge of the federal OSHA program. So, you see, the, the corruption is a terrible thing. It seeps from one place to another uh, if, if, unless you create firewalls and insist that a program here or a program there actually operates according to the law. And uh, OSHA has that responsibility but, but does, not, does not meet that responsibility. Okay, well, I want to thank you very much for joining us. We've been speaking with Daryl Whitman. Daryl was a former federal OSHA investigator for the Whistleblower Protection Program. He's also a lawyer, and he fought to protect whistleblowers, and he himself was retaliated against, and he discovered that, lo and behold, uh, the agency leadership was corrupt, and even the Office of Special Counsel, which he went to to do an investigation itself, has systemic corruption. And he's now calling for an investigation nationally, an independent uh, uh, prosecutor and, and congressional hearings to uh, get to the bottom of this systemic corruption and the, basically the capture, the corporate capture of the agencies which are supposed to regulate our health and safety and protection of the public. So thanks for joining us on Workweek Radio, Daryl. You're welcome, Steve.